before we get there, I want to talk to you about resolutions. You guys remember those things you came up with about five months ago? How many of you are following through with your New Year's resolutions? That's what I thought. Some, some don't last a day, some maybe last a week, maybe some go into months, but usually about this time, we're like, resolution, what resolutions? I don't remember making any resolutions, right? And, and, you know, here's what I want you guys to know, is that God is not a God who's tied to our calendars, all right? Just because you made a revolution, a, re- revolution, a resolution, on December 31st, and you've already failed at that resolution by January 5th, doesn't mean you're out of luck. What I love about the God I love and the God I serve is that He understands our hearts, He understands our our fickleness, He understands our waywardness, and God is a God who allows us, even today, to make mid-course corrections in our lives. And to start doing what's right. So today, out of the book of Haggai, I want to talk about resolutions. Because all of us are prone to make and then fail in our resolutions. And sometimes we make good resolutions, sometimes we make poor resolutions. But I'm going to show you this morning five things that I think we ought to bank our lives upon when it comes to resolutions. And no matter where you've been, no matter... How well you've succeeded, all I know is this. You've got right now. We've got today. And today is the day when we can begin to make better choices to set us up for an even more glorious future. So no matter where you've been or what's happened to you or no matter what decisions you make, bad or good, today's a day for us to reorient our minds and our hearts to some things that I think are worth living for. Because what you're going to encounter is a group of people who really have grown indifferent to God, have grown cold in their love for Jesus, and God has them in a place where they respond to the message of Haggai and they begin to do what's right. And so I want to navigate this historical book with you. I want to give you a little bit of the context and talk about the five points that I think are worth talking about this morning. So turn to the book of Haggai, if you would. Are you guys there? Okay, good. We've got a few weeks left on our Minor Prophets study. Have you guys enjoyed the journey through the Minor Prophets? It's been fun. It's been rich. I tell my wife, I said, every week, you know, it's like I I become uh, closer friends with somebody I I really don't know that deeply. And uh, and it's kind of fun to get to know the personalities of the prophets. And and some prophets are more intense than others. I mean, Habakkuk, the past two weeks, I'm going to tell you right now, this morning won't be as intense as the past two weeks. I've gone home after the past two weeks, and I've just kind of fell on the couch like, wow, right? Um, Habakkuk is intense. Haggai, not so intense, but equally important. Amen? We've got a few more weeks to go as we look at Zechariah in the next couple weeks, and then Malachi or Malachi, the Italian prophet, after that. (laughs) So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, But Haggai is writing during a time when... The, the Jews were held captive with the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar and, and Darius and the whole account of Daniel and his friends. Well, they were held in captivity for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, a king by the name of Cyrus said, I want you to go back home and rebuild your lives. This is awesome, right? God takes his people, allows them to be taken captive because of their disobedience. He says, I'm going to have you be captive for 70 years, but after 70 years, I'm going to set you free to go back home and rebuild your lives. So the account of Haggai, as well as Zechariah, is really the message of these people going back home and rebuilding their lives, rebuilding their homes, rebuilding the temple of God, getting things back to where they were before their captivity. If you read the book of Ezra or Nehemiah, those are also corollary accounts. So you've got this amazing history of the people of God going back home to rebuild their lives because it's all been destroyed. The Babylonians came in, laid siege to all their homes, destroyed their temple, and now they get to go back and they get to rebuild once again. So 50,000 Jews go back with a man by the name of Zerubbabel, Joshua 
and Haggai and Zechariah. And Zerubbabel represents the governor. Joshua represents the high priest. Haggai and Zechariah represent the prophets. The problem is this. They go back and they begin to rebuild and they grow apathetic towards building the temple of God. And instead of focusing on God's house and God's work, they all go and they focus on their own lives. And for 16 years, the temple of God lies unbuilt. And God wants the people to know that he is priority number one. That nothing matters more than God and his work. And yet they've grown indifferent to God. See, the temple represents God's presence among the people. God's place of meeting them for worship, for for relationship. And so by them not building the temple, it is their way of saying God does not mean anything to us. We don't value him. He's not important. So Haggai comes along and says, what you're doing is wrong. It is time to focus on what is the number one priority, that is God. Now let me ask you something. Isn't it true in all of our situations that sometimes we grow indifferent to God and the works of God in our life? Would you agree with that assessment? I'm guilty of that as well. Would you agree that sometimes... Our our feelings and our emotions towards the things of God grow a little bit apathetic, grow a little bit complacent. And isn't it good when someone comes along and gives us a little spiritual jolt to get our rears in gear? Amen? See, that's kind of my responsibility. This is where I get to fall back on Haggai and say, guys, I'm here to give you that spiritual jolt, but this is not my words. These are God's words, right? I have authority from God not to preach what I feel is good, but you need to hear the message of God because God wants to wake us from our indifference. God wants to shake us from our apathy and our complacency because all of us have dealt with or are dealing with misplaced priorities. And I'm going to tell you right now, the words of Jesus are so appropriate. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be taken care of. Okay, what is amazing about Jesus' teaching is it's so simple, even an elementary child can understand it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things. Don't you love how Jesus just kind of lumps it all into one big package? All the other stuff that we become preoccupied with, all the other stuff we become distracted by, All that stuff will be taken care of if your focus first is on God and his kingdom. But I'm going to ask you right now, look back at this week in your lives. How much of your life was focused on God and his kingdom? And how much was focused on you and your kingdom? Here's the the good news. God's kingdom will last for eternity. Here's the bad news. Your kingdom will die with you. How's that sound? All the stuff you've lived for, all the stuff you spent hours devoting yourself to, all the resources and all, all that stuff you've been putting money towards and time towards, it's all going to disappear. And 40 years from now, no one's going to care. 50 years from now, no one's going to remember. 60 years from now, it's not even going to be a blip on the radar of human history. How does that make you feel? Does it make you feel good? It shouldn't. Because God has designed each and every one of us to invest our lives in something we know will matter for time and eternity. He set eternity in our hearts. He, he's created us with spiritual appetites that nothing in this world could satisfy. He has designed us in such a way where when we follow his program and abide by his rule, rules for living, we are the utmost satisfied, we are the utmost contented, but when we don't follow him, there's a deep dissatisfaction in us. Haggai deals with this topic. Haggai chapter 1, turn there in your Bibles if you would. We're going to look at five points and we're going to breeze through them rather quickly look at verse one and we're literally going to navigate the whole book together i know my my son just asked me the the other day he goes dad have you ever read a whole page of the bible at one time i think i've I've done that a couple times son right like 
We're going to read a whole book of the Bible this morning, right? Two pages. Maybe one page in some of your, your volumes, right? Haggai, two chapters, start verse 1, chapter 1. So in the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel. So this is the prophet, Zerubbabel is the governor. He's the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So you've got prophet, priest, king, all represented. What's the word that says the Lord of hosts? Verse 2. This people says the time has not yet come, even though the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Verse 2 is the excuse that people give for not doing the work of God. It's not time yet. We've got better things to do. It can wait. Whatever excuse you want to, to put in there, that's what the people are presenting. Benjamin Franklin once said this. He said, I never knew a man who was good at making excuses who was good at anything else. What Haggai's going to get at is this. Stop making excuses. There's one thing I knew. I grew up in a household where, you know what? You did not make excuses. You did what was expected of you, and you just made it happen. We don't want to make excuses, especially when God has clearly told us this is what you should do. Look at verse 3. So then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? So here's the indictment, right? You are making excuses, saying God's work can wait. The problem is, while his work lies unfinished, it lies undisturbed, it lies just stagnant and in ruins, You're too busy making your houses all nice and pretty and stuff. God's work needs to get done. You are not making his work a priority. You're too focused on your lives. Now, now I want to clarify something here. He's not saying that taking care of your lives and your stuff is wrong. But what he is saying is he's saying when you become preoccupied with your life, and you are indifferent to the things of God, there's a problem. See, it's called balance. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and then all the other stuff will take place in your life. There's nothing wrong with the other stuff, but it is wrong when you are indifferent, you're apathetic, you don't care about the things of God. Look at verse 5. So he says, Now therefore, says the Lord, consider your way. Stop and examine your hearts. Just, 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 just stand still and just take an assessment of where you're at. Is it not good? Or is it good to stop and just realize where we're at right now in our lives? Isn't this sometimes why we come together to, to worship God, to sing songs? But isn't this a time where we can really do some honest heart work before our maker? Isn't this an awesome place where, you know, sometimes we don't like what's being said. Sometimes I don't like saying the things I have to say. But don't you realize that we all leave here going, but we need to hear it. We need to stop and take an assessment. We need to stop and consider our ways. And so today is a day where God meets us and says, how are you neglecting me? And you're so focused on you and you think that's a good thing. How come you're not seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and then realizing all other stuff's going to be taken care of? Do we not need to hear this message today? You better believe it. Verse 6, you have sown, now now here's, here's where they're feeling it. You have sown much but harvested little. You eat but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing but no one is warm enough. And he who earns earns wages to put into a purse with holes. See, you're feeling this because nothing is working out in your life. And you're wondering why. (laughs) Well, this is God saying to you, because you're neglecting me. Now, you have not tuned in to TBN, and you're not listening to a prosperity preacher right now, just to put your hearts at ease. We don't go to God and begin a business relationship where we say, okay, God, if I do this, you're going to do that. And we enter in some sort of, you know, gentleman's agreement with each other on a business type level? No. 
But I will say to you, if you don't put God first, God makes you no promise to take care of you. Let me say it another way. If you don't become concerned about the things of God first and foremost, you can have no confidence that God's going to provide you what you need. Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. There's the promise. But what you miss out before the promise is the premise. If you don't look out for him and look out for others more than you look out for yourself, you have no guarantee that God's going to take care of you. And how many of us go through life on a day-to-day basis going, I don't know where the next check's going to come from. I don't know how my pantry's going to get filled. I don't know how I'm going to put gas in my car. My car just broke down. I don't know how I'm going to pay for that repair. And I don't know where this is going to come from. And we become anxious and we become stressed out and we become freakish in our attitude because we clamor and clamor and clamor. And I wonder how many times in those situations it's God whispering to us saying, you neglected me. You failed to take care of me. You're putting your trust and your hope in all the wrong things. You're setting for yourself treasures on earth where thief and moth and rust come in and steal and destroy. And, but you're not laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. You, you have no concern for me. So there's no confidence for the person that doesn't put God as number one priority in their life. You can say God's number one. But I want to look at your checkbook. How about you guys got your checkbook on you? Or is that too geezer? Is that too geezer-like? <laughs> Pull up your online banking. Let's check that out. So you say God's number one, but your finances don't reflect that. You say God's number one, but, but, but there's areas of the, the ministry that need people to serve, and you're not serving in an area of ministry. You say that, that God's number one, but you're not giving time to advancing His kingdom for His glory you, you find time to do other things. You find uh, money to spend on other stuff. But the problem is you're not making God a priority in your time, treasure, or talent. You're giving God lip service, but your heart's far from him. See, this is where God nails us. And he nails us for a good reason. We're laying up for ourselves treasures that will, will, will rust out and they don't matter for time and eternity when his kingdom work needs to be done and it's being neglected. Why? Because of our misplaced priorities. Amen? Am I preaching now? Amen. Someone's not happy. (laughs) Verse 7, consider your ways. He says it again. Like, stop and take an inventory right now. Where are you at? Because I love those categories, time, treasure, talent. God wants all three. I talk about, you know, we talk about finances at least once a year. We do, a, we do a series on generosity and giving because money is an important topic. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. That's what Jesus says. He puts a, a huge a, a premium on, on how we use finances. It's something we all deal with. It's a common, common thing for all of us who live in this world. Time, treasure, talent. He wants all three. So many people say, I don't have money to give, but I can give time to the church. God wants your time, but he also wants your talents. See, by you saying you don't have money to give, you're saying, I don't want to give up Starbucks. Oh, I almost said it. Get a bar of soap right now. That is foul language. (laughs) See, by you saying I don't have money, you're saying I put McDonald's as priority over God. I put Ross as priority over God. I put Target in priority over God. By you saying I don't have money, you're just saying, you know, I'm not making God a priority. All of us have money. We can all give to God. The problem is, what are you going to give up in order to show that he's priority over that thing you really want to buy? See, your treasure is important. Your time. Think about your week. Think about how much time. And I'm, I thought about this the other day. I love showing my kids fun videos on, on, on the internet. Right? Fun, my wife goes, where do you get all the time to show all these videos? Like, where do you find them? And I said, I sit for eight hours a day just watching videos of cats falling in slow motion. I mean, is, it, is that not a fun thing to watch? I mean, but you think about it, you think about how quickly it is. You're like, oh my, I just sat for three hours watching senseless videos. 
right? You need to stop and think about your time. Like, what am I doing with my time that is of eternal significance? Who am I maybe needing to grab coffee with who needs encouragement? Who do I need to go volunteer with to show somebody that I love them, that they have a need that perhaps I can meet? Where are you going to take, take your time and use it for someone else's good? How about your talents? All of you are talented in something. My question is, how are you leveraging your talent, which is God-given, for his kingdom? See, God does not want armchair Christians. He doesn't want you sitting here all comfy, even though we have leather furniture. Some of you fall asleep every week in those couches. I want to do away with them. But I'm asking you, you know what? When are you going to get off the duff and get into the rough with God, right? That's not, don't tweet that. That's dumb. (laughs) That is dumb right there. But when are you going to dive in and serve somewhere? I mean, we're not a mega church. We don't have a thousand ministries to get involved in. But my question is, is just start somewhere. Where are you going to start? Come make coffee. Come serve the kids. Come clean back in the floors. I don't know. You want to serve. Just start doing something. And if you need encouragement and equipping to take your gift out to the world, which is what really God wants to do, let us know how we can help you do that. Because, and you're going to hear this right from the pastor, rather you serving the house of God here, I would much more be excited about equipping to serve God out there. Okay? We have limited ministries here. There are unlimited ministries out there. How can we equip and mobilize you to do the work of the kingdom out there? The question is, you've got to make that a priority. Because if God is not a priority, you're wondering why your life is falling to pieces. You're not making God a priority in your financial house. Why do you think your finances are falling apart? Why do you think you're walking around with deep dissatisfaction? Because you're not making Him number one. And God's saying to you, Make me number one and have the confidence that when you make me number one, that I'm your all in all, I'm going to take care of all your other needs. He shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Consider your ways. Start giving. Start serving. Start devoting your time to things that mean something more than what it means for you. Now we're talking. Go up, verse 8, to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified. It's interesting that he says go to the mountains and get wood because in this area, there are really no forests. See, it's almost like they had all the stones to lay a foundation for the temple. Then they realized that there's hard work that they actually had to get out of their comfort zones, go do some strenuous work, and they go, you know what, it can wait. Don't we want it easy? I'm going to tell you, the walk with Jesus and the life of faith is not easy, you guys. If you're looking for God to be the divine caterer, you're in the wrong religion. If you want God to challenge you and push you and to make you go further than you could ever think you could go yourself, then this is what's right for you because he's going to push you and he's going to stretch you. He's saying, go into the woods, get that wood, bring it back, make my temple glorious. Verse 9, you look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord? Because of my house which lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. And then to bring it all together in this first little mini sermon right here, he says, therefore, because you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. Because you have neglected me as the sovereign God over everything. He controls the weather. He controls the rain. He controls the soil. Look what he says, verse 8. And I called for a drought. I made your economic devastation happen. God is emphatic here in saying, you worship the creation and you neglect the creator. You think you're going to get away with that for long? I called for the drought. Isn't that interesting? Now, when we consider the world in which we live in, and if we believe in the sovereignty of God, God is in control of all things. And perhaps every little thing that's going on in the world is God's wake-up call to the world to say, you're neglecting me. Read the paper, watch the news, and pay attention because God is trying to rouse a deaf world. In the words of C.S. Lewis, 
Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Why? Because he whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. Pay attention. God calls the drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, and on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, on all the labor of your hands, on it all. And he's doing it because he's saying, you have misplaced priorities. Don't chalk it up to some like, oh, life happens. Oh, there are accidents. Oh, businesses close all the time. Listen to what God's saying, because if he's not number one, he's going to shake your world to show you that he needs to be number one. So the first point is this. I know my wife laughs, go, really? This is the first point? The time is now. Stop making excuses and start making confessions. Stop justifying selfishness and start living selflessly. The time is now. Not verse 2, right? Oh, the time's later. We'll take care of God's stuff tomorrow. There may not be tomorrow, and what will you be held accountable for today? The time of the work of the kingdom is now. And God is building his temple. And the good news is the temple is not a building made with hands. The temple is what we call the body of Christ. The temple is the very thing that Christ is the cornerstone of. The temple is the living kingdom made up of those of us who believe in Christ. Peter says living stones fitted into a holy house together. That's the building that God's doing. Why are you not investing in this? That's what God's saying. Second point, you need to realize that the best is yet to come because they obey. Here's the, oftentimes you read the prophets and the people continue in their sinfulness. But look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the governor, right, and Joshua, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. They're like, "Uh uh-huh, you're right, we're going to change. Now, if every preacher had that sort of response from their people, it would, be, uh, it would be a perfect world. It is amazing what the authority of the word of God can do. Amen? I consider it an honor and a privilege to come and share with you almost every Sunday. I consider it an honor and privilege, privilege to wrestle with the word of God during the week to figure out what would you have me say to the church father. And I consider it an honor and privilege to be able to speak with authority I don't want to dance around issues. I want to deal with with hard topics. But the best news at the end of the day is I never want to be my wisdom. It's got to be the word of God. His word is the perfect word. His word does the perfect work. You would not come if it was just my opinions. Amen? You come because you want your hearts to be exposed to the living and active word of God, which is able to cut into the deepest places of our lives like a divine scalpel. And he separates joint and marrow and soul and spirit, and he is able to perform his perfect work through his perfect word. Amen? This is why we we subject ourselves to this, and you know when his word works is when, when our hearts are convicted and we change. These people change for the glory of God. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then on the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel and Joshua, And to the remnant of the people, verse 3, notice this. Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Stop right there. These are people that are living in the past. The older remnant that came back that remember the temple that Solomon built. Now, you guys remember Solomon was not only the wisest, but he was also the richest. And because he's the rich, richest, MTV Cribs was at Solomon's temple doing the live feed and going, dude, this thing's amazing. Right? They saw the glory of Solomon's temple, and now that was laid waste. Now they're building a temple, and they're all sitting there. The people that remember the old temple are going, this one's not going to be as good as the old one. And Haggai says to them, the best is yet to come. I was part of a church before I was the lead pastor. I was just a college pastor, just a college guy. And we dealt with people week in and week out 
that lived in the past. Do you remember when the church used to do this outreach? Do you remember when the church used to do this program? Oh, those were the glory days. You expected Bruce Springsteen to come out, glory days, you know, start singing that song. You're like, no, we can celebrate the past, but you are not to live in the past. Amen. You can celebrate what God has done, but you need to know that the Bible always points forward. It always points to the future. It always tells us while there may be glory days in the past, there are even more glorious days in the future. That's why he skipped, if you skip down to verse 9, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Because what Haggai wants them to know is that the best is yet to come because the temple that they are wrapping their minds around, this physical, built-by-hands building, is not the true temple by which God speaks of because the true temple is actually a person and his name is Jesus. The best is yet to come because Jesus says the temple is is here that temple will be destroyed and i'm going to raise it up again in three days and they're like what do you mean it took 46 years to build he was not talking about a physical temple he was talking about himself being the temple so now everything in the scripture points to jesus he doesn't want you to go to a building to worship him he wants you to go to a person to worship him The place where God wants to meet his people is not in a sterile, lifeless building. He wants us to meet us in a person, his son, Jesus Christ. Christ is the temple. That's why the future glory is so much better than the former glory. The best is yet to come. For those of you living in the past, and it's hard to to, to not do that. I think about the, the years I've been involved in ministry Here's the crazy thing. I've been involved in ministry for almost 30 years. I sound old just saying that. I'm like geezer pastor. I've been serving in in the church for 30 years. And it'd be easy, and I'm not going to tell you that my heart sometimes doesn't go back to places where it's like, it was so much fun then. It was so great then. And I have to stop myself and go, but what's God doing now and what's he prepared to do? And I'm going to tell you, like, a few months ago, my wife asked me, and she goes, are you, are, you, are you enjoying ministry? Not like she was concerned, but it was probably after one of our Friday date day movies, and we're having our lunchtime conversation, you know, nothing like a little alien covenant and then talking about spiritual matters, you know, so. But she asked me, are you enjoying ministry? And I honestly told her, I think this has probably been the best season ever in my ministry experience. She goes, she started crying. She goes, I need to hear that. Because she knows where we've been. She knows what we've done. And we've done some pretty awesome things in ministry by the grace of God. But I told her, I said, there's something about right now, this season, that I don't want to do anything to mess it up. It is so good. It can be better. I can, be, I can always be a better leader and better pastor. And, but I told her, I, I'm just content right now. And she just was like, so glad I said that. And I just want to think about, I want to live in the fact that it can only get better. Things can only get more glorious. Why? Because we are all heading towards the perfect culmination of God's work in Christ one day when we will leave this world and we will spend eternity with Him. Amen? The future glory, guys, is going to be so much greater than what former glory ever, ever had. And it's all because of Jesus. Amen? Third point is this. So stop living in the past, right? The best is yet to come. Number three, the power is yours. So now as you make God a priority, here's going to be the toughest battle. Is doing doing things out of your own strength or leaning on God for his strength to make it happen. Look at verse 4. Chapter 2. Take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage, Joshua, the high priest, and all the people. Take courage, declares the Lord. Why? For I am with you. Now stop right there and underline that. I underlined that that little phrase years ago. Because we need to be reminded of that truth, that God's presence is always with us. There'll be people who will come to me and say, Scott, I don't feel God, right? I don't feel God. And I'm going to tell them this. Number one, God hasn't moved. 
and not left a forwarding address, right? It's like hide, hiding somewhere. Come find me, right? God does not move. We move, and it is up to us to get reoriented with him. See, we allow things to form barriers in our relationship. We don't make him a priority. We chase other gods. We become idolaters. We worship other stuff. And God's saying, I'm right here. I never move. See, we need to hear this about God's presence. He is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? So it's not God doing something. Now it's you cleaning out your life to say, okay, how can I once again restore the, the presence of God in my life? He's there, but you've just coated your life with so much other crap, you can't hear him, you can't see him, you can't sense him. Why? Because of sin, because of busyness, because of hobbies. I don't know, fill in the blank. But he's there. As for the promise which I made you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst, do not fear. You cannot fear when you're walking closely with God. Okay? There is no fear for the man or woman who's hearing from God, who's paying attention to God. There is no fear in the heart of a person who knows and feels God right there at their side. But there is fear for the person who neglects God. There is fear in the person who doesn't understand the importance of walking in righteousness and holiness. Verse 6 but thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. I'm going to shake the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations and I will fill this house with the glory. Verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. He says, this house is nothing compared to what's going to come, right? And I'm going to give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Here's what you need to know. That God is setting you up for success every single day. God is a God who promises that he who began a good work in you is going to perfect that good work until the day of Christ Jesus, right? Philippians chapter 1. You have no fear in the fact that God will provide you everything you need. He's going to give you the strength to walk according to his ways and his will. Too many times we think that God just throws us the life preserver of the cross and then says, good luck, I hope it all works out for you. When in reality he says, what is required more than anything is an abiding relationship with me because when you abide, when you rest, you become a human being, not a human doing, that he will give you all the strength you need to perform his will. John chapter 15. If you abide in me and let me abide in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. See, we don't know how to stop and rest. We don't know how to stop and just pray. We don't know how to stop and just center our hearts to read, to meditate, because when you do that, you will know the truth of Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Write that passage down. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling and realize that it is God who's going to work within you to fulfill everything that he wants you to do. Who's at work within you? Is it you or is it God? Because it's of you, you're going to exhaust yourself and you're going to get burnt out. But if it's God, you're surrendering to his ability, you're surrendering to his strength, you're surrendering to the spirit that is more than able and more than capable for you to do what God wants you to do, you're going to be able to do it 24-7. Why? Because it's not you, it's him. What are you feel, fueling your life with right now? The power is yours. It's right there. It's like the guy who, who gave his girlfriend this necklace that inside this necklace had the engagement ring, but she didn't know that, right? So she's wearing this necklace all around for like a year, and then after a year, he breaks open the necklace and proposes to her. Well, she was a little bit excited, but she was mad too because she's like, I could have lost the necklace. This thing of so much value, right, the, this engagement ring inside this piece of wood could have been lost. She did not know how much value she had in this necklace around that she was wearing around. If she had known of the value, she would have taken care of it, right? She would have honored it. She would have, but she didn't know, and she got mad at her boyfriend for doing that. And I wonder how many of us are, are realizing that inside of you is a treasure that is given to you by God, and you're walking around with such value inside, and yet you don't know. 
He's giving you strength and he's giving you wisdom. He's giving you everything you need pertaining to life and godliness, and yet you're treating it as if there's nothing there. So my encouragement to you is this. The power is yours. Walk in that power. It is in your weakness that his strength is made perfect. Right? He has given you more than you need to fulfill his will. Lean on him. Trust him. Point number four. See, now we're cruising. You guys are going, okay, now this is a good clip. I like this. The heart is key. In verse 10, the heart is key. Because verse 10 through 19, they're talking about holiness. Holiness just doesn't happen. <laughs> okay? I, I wish it did. I wish I could just, we could just rub off holiness on each other, right? But holiness is heart work. Holiness has to do with the heart. These people thought they could do the temple work, and just because you're doing God's work doesn't mean you're doing God's will. Just because you're involved in God's business doesn't mean you're doing it from a pure motivation. See, in order to really gl bring glory to God, He wants to make sure that not only are your lips declaring His praise and your external activity is bringing Him glory, but that your heart is in a place where you're saying, I'm doing it because I worship God. The heart is key. And if your heart is far from Him, your works don't mean anything. So a, a walk of holiness is, is huge. And then the last point, I'm going to close with this because of, of time. The restoration is sure. And I, and I want to spend time on this because this is awesome. I love how the prophets just... They just know how to close it, right? The restoration is sure. This is the work of God. He's restoring all of us in Christ Jesus. The work of restoration is sure. Look at verse 20. So the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And I will overthrow the thrones and the kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overthrow chariots and the riders and the horses and the riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. This is pretty awesome. Right, like God is just once again saying, don't mess with me. I am sovereign. I will shake the world. I will destroy enemies, blah, blah, blah. Look at verse 23. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Why is this important? two things first you are like a signet ring what is a signet ring well signet ring i think of three things having to do with a signet ring number one security number one beauty security beauty last thing authority a signet ring was worn by someone in power and it symbolized security in the sense that we are never forsaken. God is always with us, right? You have nothing to fear. Read Isaiah chapter 49 sometime. It's awesome. God says, I love you. You are my child. Does not a nursing mother take care of her baby? Does she forsake the baby who is at her breast? God is like that to you. You are his. Secondly, it's a thing of beauty. The fact that you wear a ring symbolizes something that this, this represents something precious. My wedding band, and it's the only jewelry I wear, signifies something precious, that I am married to a woman that I adore, that I love, that I've committed myself to forever and ever and ever through, through good and bad, through sickness, through health. I am this is precious, and it signifies something precious. God says to us, you are precious. You are, you are like this, this ring that I wear that sh I'm going to tell the world that, you know what, you're mine. But not only that, but it communicates authority. Meaning the one who wears the ring, the one who stamps wax documents, the one who passes laws, this is the guy in charge. Now he says this to Zerubbabel. But it's pointing to something greater than Zerubbabel because he says, I've chosen you, Zerubbabel. Now, just think about that phrase, I've chosen you. Do you know, God, guys, that God's chosen you and you are precious to him? Perhaps the greatest and most encouraging words anyone can hear is that God has chosen me. Awesome. I am so undeserving of him choosing me, but he does it anyways. 
But the reason I mention this is because if you look at Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, you know one of the kings in line of the genealogy that Jesus came out of was Zerubbabel. Jesus came out of the genealogy of Zerubbabel. And this is even more magnificent because Zerubbabel's grandfather was a dork and did not honor the Lord. I think dork is a biblical word. I think it's in there somewhere. And God says you know, to his grandfather, Jehoiakim, I'm going to remove you. You are no longer going to be blessed because you chose not to honor me. Now Zerubbabel comes along and wants to honor Jesus. And now God says to him, perfect. Now I'm going to set you up for success. Because out of your line will come the Messiah, the temple, the perfect high priest. And so what Zerubbabel represents is something that ultimately God would bring, the Messiah, to fulfill all the promises. And it's in Christ that we know the restoration is sure. And if you know, every, if you know Jesus, guess what? Everything is going to work out. Amen? But if you don't know Jesus, you have no confidence that anything will work out. So what's critical as you leave here today? Knowing Christ. More than anything else, know Christ and make Jesus a priority. Because nothing else matters. Amen? There's a college back east that wrote letter and email and message to Bon Jovi to come play at their commencement party. And after so much time of writing and pleading for Bon Jovi to come to their commencement party, guess who showed up at their commencement party? Bon Jovi. And they came and they played. And Bon Jovi had one word of encouragement to the graduating class from this university. He said this, when you think about your future, write all your plans in pencil. Because life can change anything. I don't agree with him. Can I disagree with John Bon Jovi? Is that allowed? I'm going to tell you, write your plans in ink. Because when you know Jesus, his plans will never be frustrated. Okay? Life will throw you curveballs. But when you know Jesus, you're ready for anything because he is unchangeable. He is constant. He matters more than anything. Learn that, John Bon Jovi. <laughs> know that, church. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you are awesome. Thank you for Haggai. Thank you for the word. Lord, I know we probably covered a lot of stuff. Forgive me for doing that. But I know something's going to stick. I know, I know every single person here is resonating with something. And my prayer is that they would run with that something so that it would change their lives for your glory and their good. Thank you for Jesus, our ever-present, constant in our lives, day in and day out. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Father, even when we're faithless. Thank you for your love for us. Even when we don't feel it, it's there. May we fight for the life you have given us in Christ, and may we live for your glory herein and hereout. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Come back at 1230 if you're new to the church. Free lunch and a, and a time of discussion. Love to have you here. God bless you guys. Have a great week.